this gloriously sunny Wednesday afternoon, I'd like to welcome you all to the first of our Women's Rights in Healthcare webinars. This is the third year of Women's Rights in Healthcare, but the first time it has been held as a series of virtual events. We have some fantastic speakers lined up over the coming weeks on topics including endometriosis, reducing inequality and risk in childbirth, menopause and perineal injury, and mental capacity in childbirth, to mention just a few. I very much hope you'll be able to join us for other events in the series. The subject of today's webinar is First Do No Harm, Outcomes from the Cumberledge Review. Now, following a long campaign by women who have been harmed, the 8th of July 2020 welcomed the long-awaited publication of the report of the Independent Medicine and Medical Devices Safety Review called First Do No Harm. This was led by Baroness Cumberledge and the review looked at three medical interventions with which have caused avoidable harm to thousands of women and their families. Just briefly, these three interventions are Primados, Pelvic Mesh and Sodium Valparate. And just to explain a little bit about them for those that may not have much background for this. Primados is a hormone pregnancy test taken by women between the 1950s and late 1970s. Many went on to lose their babies or to give birth to babies who were damaged. Those children are now adults and are still needing care and support. And now in their 70s, those parents still carry the guilt that taking those two pills may have caused this loss or harm. They agonise as to who will care for their disabled adult child when they no longer can. Pelvic mesh, it's used to treat pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence. Many women have suffered terrible complications following their mesh surgery that they were offered as a quick fix for their incontinence or prolapse. An operation they thought would cure them has, has in fact ruined their lives. They report that they've lost their independence, their careers, life partners, sex life, even their ability to go for a walk. Women have reported relentless physical pain, which they describe as being like razors in their body. They feel helpless, alone and ignored and some have suicidal thoughts. Sodium valparate is an effective medication for epilepsy. However, even today, it's still being prescribed to women during pregnancy when it is known that it is harmful to the developing fetus. Women were never told that their unborn child could be seriously damaged by the medication. They did not know that their chances were in fact one in two. Now these interventions have caused terrible injuries to many women and children and are very sad examples of yet again women's voices and concerns not being taken note of. Now the report has made a number of recommendations which patient groups, representatives of which are with us today, are keen to see actioned. My name is Maria Pantelli and I'm a partner in Lee Day's medical negligence team. I've been investigating potential claims of clinical negligence for those affected by sodium valparate and I'll talk to you a little bit more later on about those claims. But first, I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Foshena Michwaska and Zara Nanji of Lee Day's Product Liability and Consumer Safety Team. Boz heads up the team and has expertise relating to defective medical devices and pharmaceuticals. She acted on behalf of campaigners for those affected by sodium valparate in a government review. The extent to which the current regulatory regime for medical products, both drugs and devices, is fit for purpose. Having worked in Lee Day's personal injury team from 2007, Zara joined the consumer law and product safety team in March 2017, working on the Corin metal on metal hip implant litigation. She has investigated potential claims arising from product defects, including defective medical devices and pharmaceuticals. I'll now hand you over to Zara. Thank you very much, Maria, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my role today will be to take you through the healthcare landscape as it is and has been and also to take you through in full the nine recommendations made by Baroness Cumberledge in her first Do No Harm report. I would like to start by saying that actually there will be a lot of information uh, during my part of the talk where I refer to articles and research. There will be um, a document put up later after the webinar so that if you wanted to look into any of that further, you'll be able to find the sources of the information that we've used. 
So I wanted to, to start my talk by talking about the historical landscape for women and how women have generally been treated in healthcare and why we've got to this situation. Delays in diagnosis and problems with medication are commonplace for women in the healthcare landscape as we know it. In fact, the World Health Organization have pointed out that actually this is not a problem unique to, to England or the UK, it's actually an international problem. And they say on their website, being a man or being a woman has a significant impact on health as a result of both biological and gender related differences. So how did we get here? Why are we here? In the 1960s, there was the thalidomide disaster and that drug had catastrophic effects on women of childbearing age and, and their children. So following that disaster, the US regulator, the FDA, decided that women should not take part in clinical trials and they issued guidance about that in 1977. In, on first glance, you'd think that's quite paternalistic and it would make sense, but actually um, looking at where history has taken us to, i.e. here, um, it's actually caused more problems than giving a solution. Um, it means that women haven't been protected because drugs that affect them have not been tested on them properly and the FDA actually gave guidance in 2018 which reneged on their 1977 guidance and said that the testing not not testing women leads to unreliable assessment of effectiveness and leaves women at risk of serious harm so that's one one issue as to how we've got here another issue i found when i was doing my research and just from my experience as as a solicitor in this this area of uh, law is that actually quite often women's capacity in terms of their health care uh, can be questioned um i came upon an article by diane hoffman and others entitled the girl who cried pain so the authors of that article analyzed gender biases when it came to women and medicine and they concluded Issues of misdiagnosis and delay in women's health has a long history within our culture of regarding women's reasoning capacity as limited. From my perspective, I have no, uh, you know, I'm not surprised about that at all. And I can give you an example, a very recent example. I'm now working with women who have been diagnosed with a rare form of blood cancer, um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma related to their textured breast implants. Women have, many of the women have reported to me that when they've gone to see their doctors, they've been told, oh, it will settle down by itself, or, you know, it, it could just be the time of the month, or, you know, these things happen, and they're sort of sent away. And it is questioning their capacity to know when there is something really wrong with them, and they do know when something is wrong with them. And I wasn't surprised to see this type of research at all. Another issue as to how we may have got here is actually history has excluded women generally in terms of science, science and scientific advancements. So not only have doctors and scientists until you know, recent times mainly been doctors, but actually the research that's been undertaken, for example, um, on, on cells, they would be male cells, on animals, they would be male animals. Um, and then obviously in terms of bodies, it would be male human bodies, has meant that actually, yes, of course, there's been many advancements in medication, but actually uh, many of those advancements have really only been proved uh, to work for men. So you might ask, well, you know, why? Why do we have these single sex studies? Why does it happen? And from, from looking at matters, what I found was that actually it's just for, for consistency. So women in particular, as you know, will have a menstrual cycle. And that will mean that they have fluctuating hormones in their system, which may affect results. So what that has meant is that researchers will often just focus on testing men or if they do test women, they will test women that are in the early stages of their menstrual cycle, where their hormone levels are very similar to men. But what that means is that we don't have a proper understanding of the interaction of certain drugs and the differing hormones that the female body has. I wanted to give you um, an example which sort of amused me when I was looking at it and um, it was when I was looking at a book written by Maya Dusenbury entitled Doing Harm, the truth about how bad medicine and lazy science leaves women dismissed, misdiagnosed and sick. So she actually looked at a study in the 1960s in this book and she noted that women up until uh, menopause had very 
low rates of heart disease. So researchers and scientists saw this and they obviously wanted to test, you know, whether by introducing oestrogen, whether that would make a difference. So when they were putting together um, the research and, and, and testing this, they did manage to get 8,341 candidates to test on. Unfortunately, uh, the candidates were actually male. Um, many of you will know the effects of oestrogen on your body, um, amongst other things, um, bloating, uh, swollen breasts. Um, I did try and find out uh, from the research whether or not men were reporting these things, but unfortunately I didn't find it. So if you found, find it or you know the answer, please tell me because I'm absolutely intrigued as to, as to what they reported. The, the, the other thing I found that actually in terms of medical training, uh, doctors when they are trained are not necessarily trained in the different responses of the males and females in their symptoms. And a 2018 survey found uh, of medics, training medics found that 34% of those reporting would feel prepared to manage sex and gender differences. That means almost two thirds would not feel competent or comfortable in knowing the difference and I found that you know quite shocking. So why does this matter? Well this matters because there are differing symptoms and I can give you an example of heart attacks, we'll go back to heart attacks. Men generally tend to um, exhibit chest pain when, when they have a heart attack, that's, that's the symptom that they mostly refer to. Women might have chest pain but also they have much subtler signs when they're having a heart attack. So it could be pain in the arm, they could have indigestion symptoms, pain in the neck or pain in the jaw. And the problem is that when it's reported to medics or even when women are considering you know, what a heart attack might feel like, um, they don't know this and they, they put it down to stress. Uh, and obviously that, that's a, a critical issue. And actually the NHS UK website reported on this and they said that you know health expectancy health health um, life expectancy and quality of life was really affected by this in that women are less likely to survive a heart attack and it actually goes on to say they're even less likely to survive if they're treated by a male doctor so in terms of we, we touched upon the testing uh, uh, of drugs and um in, in between 1997 and 2000, again, I'm going to go over to our American cousins, they removed 10 different medications from the US market. And they found that of those 10 medications, eight had far more serious implications on women. And I, I, I thought about that a, a bit, and then I found a, another very interesting article on the NHS UK website. And that was from October 2016. And that was in relation to uh, the, the male contraceptive. So the male contraceptive was tested on about 320 men. And it required an injection to the buttocks uh, once every eight weeks. And actually the results found that there was a 98.4% success rate. So, so far, so good. However, the article highlighted that actually there was a high side effect rate. So what were those side effects? Those side effects were that 45.9% reported uh, having acne, and then about 5% uh, reported that their sperm count didn't recover within a year of stopping the injections. Um, I don't know how many of you may or may not have looked at a leaflet, for example, for contraception, um, but you know, when I've looked at such leaflets, um, there are an absolute array of side effects that women are always expected to put up with. So, you know, I'm not saying that it's okay, but I'm just, I, I found it quite interesting that, you know, these were the side effects that they were reporting, along with the information that whilst more than three quarters of the men and their partners said they would be happy to continue to use this form of contraception, these particularly serious complications need to be addressed. So apparently when it comes to a man, they need to be addressed. Maybe us women need to just put up with it, I don't know. Um, but actually what I found really amusing is that because of the side effects, the NHS UK website goes on to extol the virtues of just simply using a condom. So I want to take, you know, take us now to, to, to Baroness Cumbridge's uh, report. And you can see from the landscape that I've uh, talked about that actually the experience of women is far more difficult than it is for men for, for many of the reasons that I set out. 
Um, so it comes as no surprise to me. And it is obviously with sadness that I've seen that many families and women have fought for decades to get their voices heard. And the report, as Maria said, covers Premodos, vaginal mesh and sodium valparates. So the report itself was published on the 8th of July 2020. The, the report is actually entitled First Do No Harm. So first do no harm, as many of us will know, is a fundamental maxim that medics are taught, first do no harm. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting title. The one thing that I really took from, from the report was that Baroness Cumberledge and her team really highlighted the need for comprehensive pre-market testing of medicine and medical devices but also they highlighted the importance of post-market surveillance and I will touch upon this again later on uh, in terms of you know my, my very um, recent experience of that in terms of the ladies that I represent in relation to their textured breast implants. So Lee Day has not been doing this alone we've been doing this hand in hand with families and campaigning groups amongst others facts aware Valparate victims and Oaks. So the report was a combination of a two year review speaking to hundreds of patients and their families who were seriously affected by avoidable harm. Immediately when I looked at the report, one of the things I noted is that Baroness Cumberledge made it very clear that from speaking to these families and to these women, the, the overarching themes that she found were that women really found that there was lack of information when it came to making their choices about what treatment to have. They weren't able to go to someone and say, there's a problem with this product. They didn't know where to go to report problems. They struggled to be heard, often being, being felt to, like they were being dismissed or that their doctors didn't want to learn from them. They weren't interested, no one was interested. And I think for me, which I found quite painful to see, was that many women were actually feeling guilt and carrying the guilt of, of affecting their family life and affecting their children's lives through, through taking drugs or using devices that they had not properly been informed about as to, as to the risks. So I'm going to read the nine recommendations to you now in full. I, I'm going to apologise in advance. They, they are quite dense, so I hope you'll stay with me. But like I said at the beginning, we, we can put up something so that you can refer to, to, the, um, to the points that I'm raising now uh, later on. So I'm going to start. So recommendation one, the government should immediately issue a fulsome apology on behalf of the healthcare system to the families affected by primados, sodium valparate and pelvic mesh. There was an apology given by Secretary, Health Secretary Matt Hancock on Wednesday 8th of July and he said on behalf of the NHS and the whole healthcare system I want to issue a full apology to those who have suffered and their families for the frustration for the time it's taken and that they have taken to get their voices heard and now their voices have been heard. It's very important that we learn from this report that we commissioned to make sure that these sorts of mistakes do not happen again. Recommendation two, the appointment of a patient safety commissioner who would be indep an independent public leader with statutory responsibility. The commissioner would champion the values of listening to patients and promoting users' perspectives in seeking improvements to patient safety around the use of medicines and medical devices. As we've said, it's taken decades to get voices heard in respect of sodium valparate, mesh and primados. But actually, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The report actually also touches upon a number of other medications and devices, including Eshaw, the contraceptive, PIP breast implants, Roaccutane and the cervical cancer vaccination. So I consider from the experience that I've had with women with BIA, ALCL um, from their implants, that actually someone like a patient safety commissioner would be absolutely crucial in raising awareness of, of issues as they start to emerge rather than uh, much later on down the line and you can have early intervention. It's crucial that the patient safety commissioner's role would be listening to patients and I think that's been a real gap. That's one of the things that's not happened to date. Recommendation three. A new independent redress agency for those harmed by medicines and medical devices should be created 
based on models operating effectively in other countries. The redress agency will administer decisions using a non-adversarial process with determinations based on avoidable harm, looking at systemic failings rather than blaming individuals. I'm not going to talk much about this. Boz is going to cover this in great detail. So I'm going to move on to recommendation three. Separate schemes to be set up for each intervention, the hormone pregnancy tests, valparate and pelvic mesh to meet the cost of providing additional care and support to those who have experienced avoidable harm and who are eligible to claim. My comment here would be that we have had experience in this country of other compensation schemes, including the Vaccine Damages Payment Scheme, the BCJD Trust, the Thalidomide Trust. And what we've learned from those schemes is that any scheme that is set up must be properly established and properly resourced to make it useful. Recommendation five, a network of specialist centres to be set up to provide comprehensive treatment, care and advice for those affected by implanted mesh and separately for those adversely affected by taking medications during pregnancy. Again, I'll touch upon the example of the textured breast implants. Many of the women that I have spoken to told me that their doctors, their treating doctors or their GPs did not know anything about this disease. It's actually quite a new disease, but actually what would have helped and what will help is joined up thinking and sharing of information and something like centres, specialist centres, where information is exchanged and shared and you know where to go to. That would be crucial in actually uh, early intervention and helping women to know or helping doctors know what they need to tell their patients and, and would actually give a lot of confidence. Recommendation six, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulation Agency, the MHRA, needs substantial revision, particularly in relation to adverse event reporting and medical device regulation. It needs to ensure that it engages more patients and their outcomes. It needs to raise awareness of its public protection roles and to ensure that patients have an integral role in its work. Prior to the publication of the first Do No Harm report, myself and my colleagues from Lee Day were actually able to speak to the MHRA and it was in the context of the textured breast implants in May 2020. We spoke to the interim director of medical devices and we highlighted that an overhaul even at that stage was crucial. We explained that there needs to be quality of information given to patients. We also said that the guidance that they give really needed to be backed by data. And it was really important that they had transparency in terms of who their partners were, who their sources were. And that would really increase faith in the regulator, where at the moment, I believe that the people that they serve, i.e. patients, don't feel like the regulator is there for them. Baroness Cumbledge also highlighted that now is the right time to overhaul the MHRA, and that's because of Brexit, and inevitably there will be change. So I do hope that that sort of change does come. Recommendation seven. A central patient ident identifiable database should be created by collecting key details of the implantation of all devices at the time of operation. This can then be linked specifically to creating registers to research and audit the outcome, both in terms of device safety and patient reported outcome measures. So as Maria said in my introduction, I started working on devices in 2017 with the metal and metal hip claims. And I was really shocked to find out that actually there are registries, but they are, they are inadequate and they've not been adequate registries to date. So what I found, and even with the breast implant cases, what I have found is where registers exist, they've been started very late, for example. So after the PIP scandal, there was a recommendation that a breast implant registry should be set up. That was in 2012. It took until 2016 for that registry to be set up. And even when it was set up, it was opt-in. So you had to decide that you wanted your details or your doctor wanted your details to go on that register. And that just meant that it wasn't being completed properly. And about 12 months ago, it became opt-out. Um, but the problem with not having proper registries is 
for when you come across a problem you say there's a problem with this product they'll say well you know the data doesn't support that and it's like well, why doesn't the data support that well the data doesn't support that because the data doesn't exist so these registries are crucial because it's the only way to collect data and look at the long-term effects of medicines and medical devices Recommendation eight, I hope you're still with me. Transparency of payments to clinicians needs to improve. The register of the General Medical Council should be expanded to include a list of financial and non-procunary interests for all doctors, as well as doctors' particular clinical interests and their recognized accredited specialisms. In addition, there should be mandatory reporting for pharmaceutical and medical device industries of payments made to teaching hospitals research institutions and individual clinicians. Again, I'm going to go back to my discussion in May with the MHRA. There is advice on their, on their website, um, particularly about the, the breast implant cases, which is the example that I'm giving. But actually, although they said that we're, we're getting advice from these, this, this team of people, and this is what they're called, we didn't know who was part of that team. And I pointed out that, you know, if you're saying you've got specialists and experts involved and they're willing to give this information and stand by it, then why, why is there a problem with publishing their name? Patients should know who is providing the information and where it's coming from. So, you know, I, I really do think that transparency of payments and relationships is really, really important for patient confidence. Recommendation nine, we're finally here. The government should immediately set up a task force to implement the review's recommendations. Its first task should be to set out a timeline for, the impl for their implementation. So Boz is going to focus on this, but I'm going to just say that if a task force isn't put in place, if these recommendations are not driven forward, then they're just going to gather dust and, and pay lip service to the, the, where we've got to now. So we really do need this to, to be pushed forward. I actually just want to leave you with a quote which I thought was really helpful and it's from the recent uh, reading of the Medicine and Medical Devices Bill which Boz is going to cover um, and it, it really stresses why um, patients must be the at the heart of, of the healthcare um, landscape. So Baroness Burt of Solihull said, a lady local to me wrote about the excellent Cumberland report. She said, Mesh has ruined my life. I've lost my colon, my appendix, my cervix, my uterus, and parts of my vagina to mesh. I've lost four jobs, and I will shortly be losing my home since I cannot work. I shall call this lady Jane. Jane, like many of us, has been brushed off, patronized, accused of imagining her symptoms, or being hysterical. While the perpetrators have closed ranks covered up their mistakes and made her suffer. Vaginal mesh has caused women extreme pain, like having razor blades inside of them. But the treatment of women over mesh and the two drugs in her report seem symptomatic of a culture of exasperation, impatience and disbelief on the part of medical professions, professionals when women tell them what they are going through. Barbara Ellen of The Guardian speculates about what would happen if the boot were to be on the other foot and men had implants that felt like slashing razors. Would they be written off as hysterics and whinges? So although that's a bit of a toe-curling example of men having penis implants that feel like razors, I think it really does hit home. Um, so having left you with that example, I'm going to pass on to Boz, who's going to tell you what we're going to do to make sure this doesn't continue to happen. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Zana. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, so I'm Boz, and as Zara said, I'm, I'm going to run you through where we are with the, recommend, with the key recommendations, and what we think we can do to make sure that these can get implemented and how we can ensure that there's a proper redress scheme in place for individuals. Yeah. The Medicines and Medical Devices Bill, currently under consideration in the House of Lords, um, really presents a real opportunity to address the issues raised in the report and to provide a mechanism by which those recommendations can actually be put into effect by primary legislation. 
We and the Sodium Valparate groups have been lobbying peers to accommodate Baroness Cumberbatch's recommendations within the bill insofar as they relate to avoidable harm caused by medical pro um, products. Now, the bill has, its, has had its second reading uh, on the 2nd of September. Um, Baroness Cumberbatch gave an impassioned opening to the debate as follows. My Lords, I stand before you as a person who was shaken by the experience of personally listening to over 700 women and their families who have been damaged by the healthcare system. Their testimonies actually haunt me. Their bravery impels me to right their wrongs. We had strong, report, strong support from uh, Lord Philip Hunt, Hunt, who has been very supportive of getting the recommendations implemented via the bill. He pointed out as follows. On patient safety, ministers are silent on whether they will accept many of the recommendations of the Cumberbatch Review. In particular, will the minister support the appointment of a commissioner for patient safety? Zara has explained to you already how important it is to have that patient safety commissioner. We strongly, we strongly believe that it's vital in preventing future harm. The government, must, the government must also ensure that the needs of those who have already suffered harm are now also properly catered for. The sodium valproate groups have campaigned tirelessly to highlight the issues with sodium valproate in pregnancy. It's their campaigning that has brought about warnings and awareness among clinicians and patients. And were it not for their efforts, many more women would be still being prescribed the drug in pregnancy and many more babies would have been affected. You know, they've been let down by the healthcare system and the, and the justice system. It would be a travesty if we missed the opportunity to implement Baroness Cumberbatch's recommendation for a redress scheme for them. Some of you may remember um, Dan Brennan, or Lord Dan Brennan, as he's now known. Uh, he was counsel in the fax litigation led by David Bodie. And he put this imperative far more eloquent, eloquently than me uh, when he said, the conduct of the affected families described in the report is exemplary. The way, to try, the way they try to cope with their suffering, their attempts to change things, to be listened to, and to make reasoned submissions. And they serve the assistance of this house and the government. He went on to say, the noble Baroness's report therefore recommends that the government should act. First, it should create a redress agency. Doctors and staff are taught first, do no harm. The necessary consequence of that is if harm is done, then there, must, then there should be a remedy for it. That can be best done, which does not take away social care, special educational provision, or additional provision, but gives help in addition. Some of these children will never be able to manage their affairs on their own. We should pay for it. It should include manufacturers of drugs and medical devices. The industry's capitalized market in this country is several hundred billion pounds. The French company Sanofi, which makes sodium valparate, have a capitalized value of over 100 billion euros. Such companies can afford to contribute to the downside that comes from their place in the market. The review recommended that there should be three schemes at least to provide additional support for those who've been harmed by Primandos, pelvic mesh and valparate, and it should be administered by a single standalone redress agency operating on an ombudsman model that administers multiple schemes, each with their own eligibility criteria and funding, one that's simple for patients to access, and one with a fixed point of contact and flexibility to adapt and respond to situations as they were arise rather than starting from scratch for each new intervention. The full list of the proposed amendments to the bill uh, is on the House of Lords website and we are glad to note 
that they include amendments to include the Patient Safety Commissioner and an expert task force. We're also pleased to say that Lord Philip Hunt recently tabled a further key amendment to bring the proposals before Parliament to establish a redress agency for those harmed by medicines and medical devices. The bill is now going to be passed onto the Grand Committee of the House of Lords, where it's going to be debate, debated before it's being sent back to the House of Commons. Now, the proposed amends, um, as I said, they're going to be amended. They're hopefully they'll get through the House of, they'll get through the Grand Committee, and they will get through the House of Commons. But we can appreciate that civil servants may balk at the perceived complexity of setting up a scheme just for the three products, let alone a whole agency. But as, as Zara said, you know, there's been a number of schemes established to high profile medical failures. Uh, as, as Zara said, the vaccine damages payment scheme, the variant CJB trust and thalidomide trust. And we would say that these schemes provide invaluable lessons for what works and what does not work efficiently and fairly for patient groups. And we should build upon them and improve on them. So we've suggested to Matt Hancock that he brings together an expert working group of specialists in the fields of product liability, regulatory law, personal injury, social services, and care, who can work with legislators to prepare proposals based on their collective experience and research in this area, so that redress schemes that are operating through the redress agency can meet the present needs of patients, but are also sufficiently adapted to respond uh, to developing um, concerns and, and unforeseen circumstances like, like COVID. Uh, we do appreciate that uh, Matt Hancock might have his hands a bit full at the moment, uh, but that does actually underline the need for this. You know, with the rapid rollout of vaccines that may not, you know, for COVID, that may not have been as rigorously, 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 me, rigorously tested as they should have been, you know, we can expect the likelihood that there are going to be some people who have very severe and life-changing adverse reactions. This, as I said, this really underlines the imperative of getting this redress agency in place and all of the other recommendations in place as soon as possible. So to assist with the devising of a redress agency that makes a proper provision for the needs of patients and that facilitates dignity, autonomy and control for effective families and sufferers. Working with David Bodie, who's tirelessly championed the cause of Valparate victims, and with experts in collective redress and consumer protection and regulatory law, such as Professor Duncan Fairgreave, um, and building on the redress scheme recommendations within the report, we've drawn up another nine headline principles, which we think should govern the operation of the agency and the relevant schemes. So I'm going to take you through them. I do apologise if uh, they take a, if I'm taking you through a list. Um, bear with me. So principle one, the redress agency should be a standalone and independent organisation outside, outside governmental and industry structures with an independent and dedicated governance structure. This speaks for itself. It must be an independent body. It must not be influenced by manufacturers or government policy. It's there to protect and promote the interests of those harmed by medical products. Principle two, the redress agency should be based on an ombudsman model, able to undertake and or commission its own investigations by means of a non-adversarial process and be free to be accessed by any affected patients who have suffered avoidable harm. Key here is it must be free. An individual who needs to issue a claim in the high court of high value, they've got to pay a court fee of up to £10,000. You know, that becomes prohibitive. You know, it's got to be borne in mind that the cost to of establishing liability and investigating causation in a highly contested case, even where a product has already been found to be harmful, harmful and been recalled, is again prohibitive, particularly where the manufacturer, the defendant, holds all the cards. We need to step away from that model. 
you know, and as the review stated, the onus must not be on the injured party to prove their case. So this leads us to principle three. Um, the compensation or redress should be automatically made available to patients without the need for them to establish and prove the nature of defect where a product has been withdrawn or recalled or its use limited either by the manufacturer or the regulator pursuant to adverse event reporting or where independent research has established causation or identified evidence of the occurrence of avoidable harm. Principle four, the redress agency should have discretion to determine the exact principles on which remedies in respect of medical products are to be awarded where avoidable harm has occurred. Starting from the, from the premise that, the, that this should be on a no fault basis, focusing on institutional and or systemic dysfunctioning. However, where there's been found to be wrongdoing on the part of the corporate body or individuals in their capacity as officers of that corporate body, they should be individually accountable or civilly or, or criminally liable as appropriate. Now that last bit slightly goes away to, you know, from the review's recommendations in relation to the redress scheme, the no fault scheme. You know, the review commented that the majority of mistakes are system errors whereas litigation deals with the culpability of individuals or a company. Um, a shift, if shift to judgment based on systemic errors aids open disclosure and prompt resolution. Um, but the review considered that this shift from individual culpability or blame to a systems-based responsibility for harm was essential. And we agreed the focus should be on whether the harm could have been avoided if the actions the system had taken had been modified. However, there are examples where the behavior of an organization or an individual is so egregious that there must be civil, if not even criminal accountability. And the onus should not be on the injured party to bring them to account. Principle five. Uh, where am I? Here we go. Uh, the, considering the impact of the harm caused on patients' lives, proper legal funding provision and expert support should be made available to affected patients to assist them in, amongst other matters, fully quantifying their current and future needs and past losses and negotiating and determining a fair settlement. Doing that needs funding. Our, our jobs as lawyers is not only to establish liability, our job is to make sure that we have properly determined the patient's needs for now and for the future and for their lifetime, so that any settlement adequately meets those needs. And then if we don't get that right, we get sued. Patients' needs are complex. They require expert evidence to determine prognosis and care needs, etc. Patients need support in that exercise and support in determining whether that settlement is going to work for them. Principle six. The redress agency should exercise discretion in determining the appropriate remedy for cases submitted to it, with a priority given to a financial rather than non-monetary redress. In determining quantum for financial redress, awards should, as far as possible, mirror the levels of awards made by courts in equivalent circumstances. The consideration should also be given to the interactions between payments from, from these schemes and benefits and taxation system. But it's important to remember that parents, patients want autonomy and control. Uh, from the women that I've spoken to, they don't want, they don't want to be in a situation where an increase in one or another benefit might be at risk uh, if, if I'm, and I'm at risk of losing it if their circumstances change. They need certainty. Principle seven, the redress agency should be properly resourced through a sustainable funding model, preferably from both private and public sources. 
in manufacturers levy should be imposed on manufacturers and suppliers of medical medicines and medicine, medical devices and medicines. It should also be ensured that there is no possibility for the agency's funders to influence the day-to-day -day working or overall policy of the agency. Now, the review even stated that placing medical products on the UK market should be made conditional upon contributing to a scheme, and we can thoroughly, thoroughly support that, but also underline the importance of independence. Principle eight, nearly there. <coughs> the existence of the redress agency should not affect access to litigation through, um, through remedies through the courts. Uh, the redress agency process will simply supplement the current dispute resolution and affected patients will remain free to bring legal proceedings in the normal way. The review's not advocating that it should replace litigation, but it did state that the design and process and function should reflect court expectations of what constitutes an acceptable alternative dispute mechanism. Uh, and also, it, it should mirror the awards made by the courts. And that's part of our principles. It's about creating a new way of delivering redress in the future. I'm aware, you know, where you've got, where, pa where patients are provided with funded representation, they've got a redress scheme that works fairly and swiftly, and compensation is awarded that mirrors the level of awards made in the court. Litigation in respect of medical products should be redundant. It's, litigation is an extremely stressful and long-winded process for patients, no matter how the lawyers try to smooth the path for them. Litigation should always be the last resort. I'm doing myself out of a job. Um, principle nine, over and above its role in the provision of redress for past harm, the redress agency should also take a lead in harm prevention by working closely with regulators, in particular the MHRA and a proposed patient safety commission. You know, there's got to be a holistic approach to this. They've got to work together. Um, so where are we? This, where are we now? The second reading, um, following the following the second reading, uh, a first do no harm all party parliamentary group has been set up, and it's led by Baroness Cumberbatch and Jeremy Hunt. And the purpose of that group is to make sure that the amendments of the report are implemented. But ultimately, it's still it's got to be, you know, it's, it's got to be made part, part of primary legislation. Um, I'm going to end up with a quote from Baroness Cumberbatch's speech to the House of Lords. Uh, we parliamentarians are establishing a parliamentary group called First Do No Harm. Its purpose is to ensure that all our recommendations are implemented. The only cloud on the horizon is the Department of Health and Social Care, which simply does not get it. Asking everyone, as it does now, to work together better in the future simply will not work any more now than it did in the past. We need someone and something new, a patient safety commissioner. Yesterday we heard that the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has announced that Scotland is to have a patient safety commissioner on our lines. But in England, rumours are absolutely rife of a ritual burial and answers to the PQs are evasive. I say to my noble friend, the Minister, this is the opportunity to give an assurance that this report will be implemented with a task force and timetable as set out in our recommendation nine. Please, can the families who have been hit so tragically hard have that assurance? Now, before I, before I end, I just want to point out that, you know, as previously stated, you know, the sodium valproate campaigners, through their dogged determination, they, they have brought about better warnings. There's, and which Maria will take you through. So, but really, there are better warnings there now for uh, for sodium valproate and for epilim. Um, there's really no excuse for women of childbearing age to be who to be prescribed the drug without proper warning. 
unfortunately it's still happening and sometimes with devastating consequences. So, and I believe it, Maria is going to be able to tell you what can be done in those circumstances and why. So Maria, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boz. That was, that was really interesting. And, you know, hopefully those practical solutions proposed can be taken forward. Now, I'll be focusing primarily on sodium and valparate, um, and we'll just take you through what is sodium and valparate spectrum disorder for those that don't know. And please forgive me. I imagine there's a large cohort that, you know, are very au fait with this. So please forgive me for taking you through it. I'll then look at its impact, the previous attempts to bring a claim, um, the, you know, the failings in our current healthcare system and how redress and litigation may still be the route for some. So in terms of sodium valparate, it's important to put the issues into context by setting out the key dates when the various concerns were emerging. So sodium valparate and related medicines are licensed in the UK to treat epilepsy and bipolar disorder. Now these medications are also used for migraine prophylaxis and pain management and approximately 27,000 women of childbearing age take Valparate in the UK. Now in 1972, at the time that it was being licensed, it was already known to be harmful to a developing fetus in animals. And information provided to doctors via the data sheet stated that it should only be used in severe and resistant cases of epilepsy. We then have further updates in 1984, which give advice on monitoring and breastfeeding, and then in 1990, which include the risks of neural, neural tube defects. We then move to 2003, where the warnings include, were given to doctors included an association with developmental delay. And the guidance warned that the overall rate of malformations was two to three times higher than the rate in the general population. And that's quite a significant number. In 2005, this was updated to include the impacts on verbal IQ. 2004 sees the first national NICE guidelines on the management of epilepsies in children and adults. And it clearly stated that it was the responsibility of the clinician to give accurate information and counselling, tailored to individual needs to enable girls and women to make informed decisions. And this is really the key moment actually where we believe that doctors really ought to have been aware. As time goes on in 2010, there was a warning to include autism. 2012, the information was again updated and set out that the risk of congenital malformations was approximately 10%. This was again echoed in the guidelines, the NICE guidelines of 2012, which included specific advice that when prescribing sodium valparate to women and girls of present and future childbearing potential, doctors should discuss the risks, possible risk of malformation and neurodevelopmental impairments on an unborn child, particularly with high doses of this anti-epileptic drug. In 2012, we have the Pregnancy Prevention Programme, which is still in place. And currently, all girls and women of childbearing potential should only be treated with valparate if the conditions of the pregnancy prevention program are met. And these are, they should have received counselling about the risk of valparate treatment and the need for effective contraception and have signed a risk of acknowledgement form. They should be on highly effective contraception and are reviewed by their specialist at NIST annually, which I'll come on to a bit later. So we have the NICE guidelines for 2018, which put the risk of valparate as causing malformations in 11% of babies and developmental disorders in 30 to 40% of children after birth. Now this is a significant number and it is now actually contraindicated in pregnancy. So although it can still be prescribed if it is the only form, if a woman is particularly resistant to other forms, its use is actually unlicensed. Now, despite all the efforts of the Pregnancy Prevention Programme and the guidelines, women are still becoming pregnant whilst on valparate without any knowledge of the risks. This means that hundreds of babies each year are still being born today, having been exposed to that risk. Now, what is fetal valparate spectrum disorder? In short, it is known as FVSD, and it had been previously known as fetal valparate syndrome. Now, it's the name given to a pattern of birth defects and developmental problems that may be seen in children whose mothers took sodium valparate during pregnancy. 
affected children have a higher chance of having birth defects such as cleft palate, spina bifida, heart problems, limb defects. They have an increased risk of language problems or difficulties, intellectual disability, memory problems, learning and behaviour problems. So, the, risks, so the, the impact of that can be quite wide ranging from quite minor defects to very life changing ones. What's been difficult is that there's been no systemic data collection on the numbers of people affected. Um, what we do know is the higher the dose, the more frequently children show the physical and developmental difficulties. And it's estimated that approximately 20,000 people have been affected in the UK by in utero exposure to valparate. I mean, the, the Cumberland Review heard some very some terribly traumatic um, testimonies from women and families affected. And I'd just like to sort of flag up some of those quotes. Um, one parent has said, I felt so guilty. I felt it was my fault for his problems and disability. Not to be told what these tablets can do and have done to so many families is terrible. Another said, if I'd been told my baby could have been damaged by the medication I was taking, I would not have taken it. All our hopes and dreams were destroyed by this, but we love our son dearly. We weep for the child who could have been and the man who never was. Others are calling for accountability quite rightly and um, for the way that they've been let down by the healthcare system and have said, people need to be held accountable for how this drug has been allowed to be prescribed to pregnant women and the lifelong effects this is having on the individuals affected. We need to stop this happening to anyone else in the future. Women describe their feelings of guilt that the medication they needed to control their epilepsy has harmed their child. Some women also believe that they've suffered miscarriages and stillbirths as a result of this medication. Women have struggled in accessing appropriate care and support for their children. They're concerned about the lifelong impact on their children, some of whom discover further problems as they get older, and they have fears for the future for those who are vulnerable and unable to live independently. Actual young people who have been affected by the, their exposure to Valparate in utero have described experiencing anxiety and depression. They describe loneliness, isolation from their peers, and difficulties forming relationships. They need help to cope with everyday life in some situations. They're concerned about their existing health issues worsening or new health problems developing. And as Boz has already set out, the impact on a family of having one parent with epilepsy and one or more children with physical and or neurodevelopmental problems from Valparate exposure is a double disability. Boz has also referred to the previous attempts to bring claims. Um, just to take you briefly through this, in the 1990s, a number of women and children brought claims against the NHS Litigation Authority, now called NHS Resolution, alleging that exposure to sodium valparate in utero had caused damage and that they'd not been warned of the risks. However, advice received by lawyers for the NHS Litigation Authority was, at the point at which many women were prescribed sodium valparate, it was not widely known that it should not be used as a first-line treatment in women of childbearing age. And following this, the NHS Litigation Authority gave advice to the claimant's legal team and the Legal Services Commission, who's now called the Legal Aid Agency, that they would have a better chance of success against the manufacturers. So off they went, um, and in 2004, we have claims being brought against Sanofi, the main manufacturer of sodium valparate. These claims were funded by the Legal Services Commission, were known as the Fax Litigation. But unfortunately, the process was halted in 2006 due to withdrawal of legal aid. This was then challenged through a judicial review and legal aid was restored for it to only be subsequently withdrawn again in 2010, just a few weeks before trial, leaving those women and their children without really any compensation or any recourse. In terms of the redress scheme, Boz and Zara have already covered the various recommendations and Boz has covered this in detail. Um, what should be noted is that the review does not advocate that the redress um, agency should replace litigation, but it is about a new way of delivering redress in the future. And I think the words in the future are quite relevant. So whilst this sounds like a welcome proposal, what happens until its implementation? And although the review recommends that a task force be set up immediately, it is unlikely, particularly given the current climate, I think, that this is going to come into fruition in the near future. 
It's also unclear as to how the redress scheme will operate and for whom, as it seems to relate to future incidences. So will they just be for future claims? And what happens to those families that have already been affected? Uh, you know, we'll need to wait to see, you know, as to how that's fleshed out. The key date that I think that there was no excuse for patients not having been warned about the risk is really in 2004 when the national guidelines on epilepsy were published. Um, this therefore leaves a number of women and children who have been affected dependent on any redress scheme, perhaps hopefully addressing the historical claims. And the access to specialist centres will be crucial for them to provide them with the appropriate support and guidance that they need. Now for those women who are pregnant from 2004 onwards, they also have an alternative route through litigation. And we can therefore, we're therefore acting on behalf of those children who've been affected by exposure to sodium valproate from 2004 onwards. Now the basis for such a claim, and I apologise that this is a bit lawyerly, is the Congenital Disability Civil Liability Act 1976. And I'll read from the Act. Under the 1976 Act, a child born alive and suffering from injuries as a result of an occurrence which affected either a parent in his or her ability to have healthy children, or the mother in the course of her pregnancy, or the mother or child in the course of labour, has an action against any person responsible for that occurrence. This is provided that person would have been liable in tort to the affected parent had the latter been injured. So to put this in language that we can understand, a doctor who negligently prescribes a drug causing deformities in a fetus would be liable to the child if and when born. So in order to succeed, we would need to establish the conventional elements of liability for clinical negligence. So the defendant would be liable if the parent had been negligently prescribed a drug which had caused injury. The test incorporated into the Act is the common law BOLIM test, which states that the defendant is not answerable to the child for anything he did or admitted to do when responsible in a professional capacity for treating or advising the parent, if he took reasonable care having due regard to the then received professional opinion applicable to the particular class of case. So this is where the emerging guidance over the years is going to be particularly important in order to identify what was available and as already set out, 2004 is really the lynch pinch, uh, lynch point of this, where we have the, the guidelines very clearly stating the advice. Now, it's very clear from the review and what's been reported to us by clients that the healthcare system and doctors have failed to listen to the concerns of women and to take action and responsibility to address these. Now, this has also been compounded by manufacturers failing to acknowledge that their product is causing harm, which is the very opposite of what it ought to have been doing. This has led to a failure to recognise their obligation to contribute towards help and support for patients who have suffered harm. In terms of the various failures, women were not informed of the risk. They were therefore deprived of their ability to make informed decisions about their treatment and family planning options. The information provided to prescribing doctors stated that sodium valproate should only be used in severe and resistant cases and was known from 1972 to be harmful to the developing fetus. Yet doctors did not discuss these risks with them prior to their pregnancies. It's therefore clear that informed consent as set out in the Supreme Court judgment in Montgomery was not obtained. In some cases, some women were actually flagged up, you know, and asked the question about their medication and they were reassured that it was safe or that their problems to their unborn baby would be very minor or could be fixed. Another issue is not all women had, and even now don't even have, regular access to a neurologist with whom they can discuss concerns relating to their treatment and pregnancy. We also see a failure to act on emerging risk, such as strengthening warning, warnings, ensuring that doctors were following up-to-date guidance and monitoring women this may be because the known risks, um, despite the known risks, no system was put into place to collect the data on the outcomes of pregnancy in women taking sodium valproate and any other anticonvulsants. Had they done so and they had this data, many women would have been able to discuss a change in their treatment with their neurologist prior to becoming pregnant. Again, we see a failure to act on concerns raised by women. They had their concerns dismissed by doctors thereby preventing them from making an informed choice. 
And this was also the case afterwards when their child was affected by fetal sodium valproate disorder. This impacted upon their ability to access support and also to make decisions about subsequent pregnancies. So we see in families, all children being affected and even though their first child was because the doctor did not simply address this concern. So then we need to look at why did healthcare professionals not act upon the guidelines? Now there are a number of routes by which information about the risk of valparate during pregnancy was communicated, but it's clear that some doctors were either not receiving or not acting upon the information. And the review looked at why simply increasing the availability of information did not lead to changes in practice and to patients receiving the information they needed. And some of the reasons that have been put forward are there was information overload, alert fatigue, clinician capacity. So there was a recall of women of sodium valparate for a medication review in 2017, but it may be that GPs did not have the capacity to carry this out. And so that was an opportunity that was lost then. We also have other factors such as the severity of the risk was minimized. The ability to manage the consequences was overestimated. Um, in balancing the risks and benefits, it seems that doctors prioritized the medical treatment of epilepsy. There was also uncertainty, which is what I've heard from a number of clients as to who was responsible for preconception counseling, um, if anyone. So what we have is sadly, babies being harmed by their exposure to sodium valparate. And without doubt, the safety of your unborn baby is of paramount importance to a woman who is considering a pregnancy. And it can, it's devastating to discover that the medication prescribed to control your epileptic convulsions has caused harm to your baby, of which you were not counseled prior to becoming pregnant. The injuries caused to their baby through no fault of their own is a terrible burden for a mother to have to live with. Mothers and families whose children have fetal valparate spectrum disorder face immense challenges caring for children with complex health needs, whilst those mothers still also have to manage their own epilepsy. As Boz has already set out, some of the children have very wide range of needs and need 24 hour care. And sadly, there is no cure for fetal valparate, valparate spectrum disorder. So for those children diagnosed, the only route for parents is to seek the best medical treatment and support for them and their child which is not always easy to put into place. It's therefore submitted that really, unless we have an effective redress scheme that, that assists all families, for some of those families, litigation may still be the only route for them. These women and their children have been let down by the healthcare system. Health professionals did not, and in some cases still do not inform them of the risks. Health regulators have not done enough to make them do so. Many families have suffered financial hardship, including the loss of their homes. They've had to give up their jobs to look after their children. There's been a complete lack of support and help. They've suffered from harrowing experiences. Families and relationships have been placed under strain or destroyed. These are the awful consequences are as a result of sadly women once again being overlooked and not listened to. And the report is therefore incredibly important and it's imperative that the government and healthcare system takes note to ensure that women and their families are not harmed in this way again and on such a scale again. I hope that brings me to the end of my presentation and, um, and of what we wanted to say. We'll now open up the session to questions from our audience and Boz will direct us to those questions. We had quite a few questions through. Um, I am off mute, aren't I? Yes. <laughs> And okay, so we start with, uh, if I may say this comes from uh, Valparate Victims Organisations, one of the campaigners. Uh, my concern as a campaigner is that the meds bill may begin a race to the bottom in order to attract pharma industry post Brexit. So easy compensation schemes, then, so easy compensation, then put compensation and justice in second place. How can we ensure that this will be a race to the top? This is about, I think what you mean is that how can we ensure that there is accountability and that there is access to justice? Uh, and this is where, I, if, I, if I may answer this, um, my own view is that this is why we really need to make sure that you've got a redress scheme in place 
that is really, really well set up. That's why we're suggesting you've got to have an expert working group in place so that you don't make the same mistakes that were made in the past. But there is, um, it, it, I, I think that the point is, however, that the Baroness Cumberbatch wanted to get away from the blame culture. She wanted this to be a no fault scheme. And so ultimately, the, the priority of a redress scheme is to make sure that the, the patient that has got adequate needs in place, that they're properly catered for for now and in the future, and then you know that it's not just you know, one off 250 grand payment at maximum that you get in the vaccine damages out, which doesn't necessarily cater for all of the very substantial needs that individuals have, rather than it being about accountability and uh, we do think that this is an issue people want justice they want accountability um and and that's why they haven't she makes the point that it's not to replace litigation and the choice is still there it's a question of viability at the end of the day what, what do you think i mean i like Oh, sorry, no, go on, sorry. No, 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 carry on. Sorry. So I, I was going to say, I can, I can understand the concern because the concern is that in order to attract business to the UK, they want the, the government would want to make it attractive. And if you've got sort of a levy where you have to pay into um, a fund uh, for compensation, that might put um, you know companies off. But the pharmaceutical industry, the device industry, is multi, multi, multi billions of pounds, and it might mean that it eats into their profits a bit. But the profit margins are so high that actually you know and and we have got this market you know it's it's basically a levy for entering the market to make profit so i mean i guess it would be seen as a, another form of tax and we've got a system in the uk for when there is an accident a car accident for example and the the driver's uninsured it's run by the motor insurance bureau and that is funded by insurance um companies paying basically a levy uh, into a pot so that when uh oh, you've lost you Oh no! <laughs> Have I not? Are you there? Um, that, that, that's placed on the motor insurance industry. It's paid because the profits are so large that they're not actually, um, yes, it eats in a bit, but it is still worth their while entering the market because there is money to be made for them. So I, I'm less concerned about the levy. I think it's actually quite a good idea. I certainly agree with Sarah. Uh, exactly. I like you echo what. <laughs> You know what I was going to say. Um, should we move on to an another question, Boz? You... Sure. Uh, this is quite a um, NHS fragmentation and privatisation plus the internal market setting trusts setting trusts against each other has surely led to sharing less sharing of medical expertise for commercial reasons, rationing and substandard care based on postcode lotteries. This is only going to get worse with the imposition of ICSs and the merger of CCJ, CCGs and the private companies will, which will be making decisions about what services will be offered. Who deserves those services? The rationing of appointments with GPs and other medical professionals. More and more private interests, vested interests involved in the healthcare system in the UK and therefore conflicts of interest. There was an IBD registry and even the people working there didn't know that it was an opt-out system as advertised on the post hospital clinic. How do you ensure patients are made aware of opt-out schemes? I did not agree to my private information being shared with the registry, which has a private, which has private companies involved and which would be privatized in the future and our info used for profiteering. Um, now, the issue is not about, my view is, for a scheme, for a registry to work, it's got to be mandatory. They don't need to provide your own personal data. It's just about identifying this hip, this particular hip implant was implanted on such and, in such and such a hospital by such and such a surgeon, and it lasted this long and it failed because of this. You don't need to have the information there about the individual patient. Without that, without it being mandatory, a registry is not going to work. Zara, you were talking about registries. What, what's your view on this? My view is actually, you know, I, I completely understand. Um, the, 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 I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the person that's asking the question. Uh, I completely understand the concern that there would be about sharing of data. But um, a, a few years ago, uh, many of us lawyers will know because, you know, it, it 
gives us shivers when we hear, hear it. There was something called the GDPR regulations. So that um, it protects our data and it really does uh, put in place uh, very stringent regulations in terms of how our data is shared. So were your data to be shared um, basically without your consent, um, you, you could you, you could deal with that via those regulations so um i mean you, i think there needs to be more to raise pa patients um awareness about their rights in terms of their data but i think there are ways of managing the fact that um data can't just be shared by whoever uh you know willy-nilly and actually at lead we've done a lot of sort of data breach type cases because you know people are entitled to have control of their data and who their data is shared with so the next question, has the report improved the chances of success of litigation? Uh, well, that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a... Um, I think it's recognised, it set out um, a good summary in terms of um, what risks were known when and made that quite clear. Um, and I think it would therefore be quite hard to, refu to refute, obviously, you know, the, the detailed research that has been carried out. So, we would hope that it actually um, supports, um, you know, in terms of what was known at the particular times. I think what, what it does do, obviously, is make it clear that there seems to us to be quite a, which we had known a sort of 2004 being a cut-off line. And I know this may address some of the questions I've seen asking about, um, depending on when their child's born, um, you know, if a child was born in 1974, I think, sadly, it would be much more difficult um, near on impossible to bring those claims because whilst there was um, the risks to the developing fetus in animals was known, um, it would be quite difficult to prove that this information was widely disseminated. So although the manufacturers were producing this information, it probably wasn't as widely available to clinicians. From 2004, when you have national guidelines in place, um, which are very accessible um, and which everyone knows you know, to, to refer to, I think it would be quite that is really the point at which we feel able to take claims forward. Um, so sadly, um, it's, it's devastating because we know that there are hundreds and hundreds of families that, um, you know, women and children that have been affected um, by being prescribed sodium valparate in pregnancy, not having been advised about the risks of it. And, um, and it's therefore, I think really, you know, we, we, the redress talks about future claims, but I think it does need to, in the hope that it will encompass those historical claims as well and provide the support to everyone that needs it. So if that's the, the route that they wish to choose, that should be open to all. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, moving on. Um, regarding the recommendations, do you think that the medical profession's apology was suitably fulsome? Something that the RCOGs which took a while, unlike the RCSs. Uh, would deeds be better than words, i.e. no senior leaders in RCOG, BJOG and gynaeology have signed the voluntary register of financial interest, Sunshine UK, aka in case this doctor. The GMC refused to set up a register years ago, so it was set up by enthusiasts to demonstrate how easy it is. How can we help clean up the corrupting influence of money when Minister and the MHRA have to take commercial interest and UK wealth into account? Is it time to separate the functions of drug and, and kit companies, both making and marketing their products? I, I personally don't think we're ever going to get away from uh, the, the drug manufacturers who the manufacturers for actually marketing products and they want in the way they feel is appropriate uh, and also ultimately as we as we said in the uh, in relation to the address agency it's got any redress agency has to be independent it's it's got to be free from any influence from manufacturer and free from influence from government policy it's how how do you clean that clean that up so again having a manufacturer's levy they they pay X percentage of their profit as a tax that goes towards the um, uh, towards the scheme. These schemes were effectively replicating schemes that are already in place in, in Sweden and elsewhere. Zara, do you, what, what do you think? So, um, in, in terms of um, 
But this is just... in relation to cleaning up the corrupting influence of so, world. Yeah. So in terms of corruption, I think one of the things, as I said, even before the Cumberledge report came out, even before um, the recommendation was made to have a proper register of interest, and all interest, it was, you know, clinical interests, qualifications, where your money's coming from, who you're affiliated with. Obviously, that's all, you know, that's not going to be retrospective. It's going to be from the point of um, implementation. But... You know, I think that will go a long way where you have to declare your interest uh, to, to have, you know, to give confidence. And we've used the term a few times between the three of us about informed consent. And if you understand the relationships involved with, you know, why am I being advised to take this medicine? Why are they saying that this implant is great? And if you if you are able to see that, oh, you know, they're on the board of directors for this. And, you know, you might wish to question, well, you know, I, I want to know. I can see that, you know, you're affiliated you know what can you tell me about your um your competitors like why, why not them why are you better it does i mean it does give some uh you know it does put some onus on you know us in terms of taking some control too to to look into things but it allows you to have the information to sometimes ask the right questions and, and it comes back to you know in, informed consent you know when you are agreeing to something when you say yes you know fine i'll take your word for it you know um you, you know it's not just taking their word for it you know it's all out there to see so you know that the, the, the decision that you you've made is based on information that's readily available to you uh so next question uh again from a campaign group as a campaigner i think it's essential oh they've moved the screen um as a campaigner where's the question called as a campaigner um it is essential that patients re patient representatives are on the task force task force how do we know that the task force and expert working group won't simply be taken over by dominic cummings his mates very good point and ultimately again we can only my view is seeing baroness Cumberbatch speak at the house of lords you can really tell she was impassioned by this. She's determined to make this work. This is going to be her legacy. This is, she realizes how badly people have been affected and how badly they've been let down. She's, she's determined to make this work. This is, she's going to be leading the, uh, the task force to get it implemented in place. And so we put a lot of trust in her to do that. But ultimately, again, we say, get together an expert working group that it is uh, key people that have got experience in collective redress, who, have, who are patient representatives, who have got people who know from their own past experience what works and what doesn't work. Um, it's, it's really important to get an expert working group that you can really trust that they know what they're doing. And what do you think, um, Zara? Again, sorry to keep pinging questions back at you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can just, um, I just echo, I, I echo that, Boz. I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, one of the things that we've made very clear is that they are an expert working group. So it can't just be Don Cummings' mates that come in and have a nice jolly. We, we want to know, again, it's all about transparency. We want experts in their field to construct a task force, a team of people to work together to put something in place that works. And, you know, you know, transparency again, it's my key word for today, the transparency of, you know, the, not only the um, consideration of these recommendations, but in terms of the implementation and going forward, people need to have, um, sorry, not people, the MPs need to make sure that whoever they get to help them to put this together, are experts in their field because you know none you know MPs might be um, experts in certain areas, but what we what we can see is what we actually need is for them to get help when they need help. And right now, they definitely need help to get these schemes right. And the experts are there. We can put them together. We can put that expert working group together for them. Uh, all the people that sort of, that uh, contributed to the submission. I already mentioned just a few of them. Um, Anyway, we'll move on. Uh, Maria, I think this is a question for you. Uh, if my child's condition deteriorates, how does this affect a potential claim? Okay, so in, in litigation, once we've established what we call breach of duty and causation, which is liability, so we've established negligence and that, that specific negligence has caused harm. What we then go on to look at is what we call um, the losses that have been suffered to try to put 
the person back in the position they would have been in but for the negligence. Now, no amount of compensation can do that. Um, but what we look at is what, what does, you know, what does the need? So we look at the care they need. Um, it might be speech and language, physiotherapy. Um, it might need um, accommodation needs or, a, you know, or assistive technology to make, to assist them with cer certain things. And we use a number of experts um, to quantify that, to value that. And one of the things, obviously, if um, a person, a child or a young adult has a deteriorating condition, we will need to have an appropriate expert to look into that. And there are experts in fetal stage and valparate syndrome. Um, so we will need to look at what that likely deterioration will be to see whether um, is it something that we can get a general feel as to what the likely deterioration is to ensure that the, what we're claiming as part of that claim will cover that. Or would we, for example, if it's quite unknown, in some cases you can get what we call provisional damages so that we will come back if necessary to review that element. Um, I hope that answers that. It's quite complicated, um, but I hope that that answers that. And obviously what we do look at is what is the condition of the child now and what's it likely to be going forward in the future for their life expectation? Yeah, that just, that just really reflects actually the complexity uh, of trying to assess what is going to be a suitable settlement for an individual that's going to properly cater for their needs throughout their lifetime. Um, another question here, we have Matt Hancock's too busy pushing through legislation by Friday to provide immunity for organisations providing or administering unlicensed vaccines. What rights will anyone affected by the vaccine have if the bodies which benefit from these immunities cannot be sued. Well, I think the point that um, the report says is actually it's, it's not going to, well, again, I said the point that they're going to provide immunity for organisations and unlicensed vaccine for. Uh, the report, the Cumberland report itself is effectively not trying to take away the rights to litigate, but if they are granted immunity, that presents a problem. But that, therefore, underlines even more the importance of getting a redress scheme in place that's going to be adequate if they are planning to take away people's rights that it's just take that as that is really really makes the point doesn't it that, that really underlines we've got to get the redress scheme in place properly and quickly um then that would be because there are going to be and as i said in, in my um, in my chat, you know, there are going to be people that are going to be affected by this. And if, and if, if they're granted immunity, they may feel that they're not, the onus is not on there. They're not going to have the financial kick if something goes wrong. How do we balance the rights of women to make, so next question is, how do we balance the rights of women to make their own decisions about their medical treatment against clinical cern, concerns about the impact of a potential, uh, on a potential fetus? Pregnancy prevention program stipulation that women must use contraceptive methods with the highest efficacy rates cons raises concerns. There are many reasons why women may not wish to use these methods. Women can experience real side effects. If after counseling, a woman chooses sodium valparate, yet she does not wish to use a contraceptive method with the highest efficacy, long acting methods can have side effects for some women and instead uses the contraceptive pill, a less effective method, surely her wishes should be respected. This is, goes back to Montgomery, Maria. Um, so, I mean, you know, this is what Boz has said. It's all about um, and making an informed decision. So what has been advocated is that women and young young women and, and you know and girls are given all of the information um, in a way that they can understand so they can make an informed choice about what is best for them and it's not it's not necessarily that they um, cannot take that medication but they need to have the risks explained to them and you know if for diff various reasons like you've alluded you know in terms of what's you know most what's best for that woman um, and if it is to carry on taking sodium valparate then at least she's had the risks explained to her and she's made an informed decision for herself going forward so it's not 
it's not about um, that they should be prevented from doing so, it's about giving them the right advice and counselling and also perhaps exploring that, for example, um, there may be an alternative anticonvulsant which may be effective for them and actually doing this hopefully early enough um, and then having these discussions, you know, with, with girls of childbearing age so that they're aware of the information so it doesn't suddenly become to the point where they may be considering starting a family, um, that they're faced with these very difficult decisions. Thank you. There's a question directing uh, specifically to Zara. Uh, could you tell us more about the task force behind the Cumberland Review recommendations? Has it been established yet? How many deadlines have been set? So, um, I mean, the beginnings, I mean, Boz, you, you dealt with this more than I did, actually, uh, in terms of the task force. Yeah, I don't, we haven't got any deadlines yet, as far as I'm aware. The issue is about, you know, we've got the APPG in place now, and it's the APPG's role is to get the task force implemented. Um, trying to, so the issue here is to try and, the report, the, the House of Laws debate was about getting the recommendations actually implemented within the medical devices bill to actually make it legislation. Uh, but anyone I'm not aware. Uh, APPG is the all-party parliamentary Sorry. group. So, no, just so that it makes sense as to who yeah. it is, that cross-party type yeah. of legislation. Yeah, there's, there's another question here. If you, again, uh, to date, Zara, uh, are you aware of any updates on the creation of clinicians' lists for disclosure of conflicts of interest and payments by pharma. Uh, this is again something that has been um, booted in the report, raised in the report, that this is what we must have and we don't have that as yet. So Pause, um, I'm afraid um, we, we've still got a number of questions which are open but time's moving on and I'm conscious that we've had, um, you know, thank you for your participants. Perhaps what we'll do um, with the questions that we haven't unfortunately been able to answer live, we will come back to you um, with an answer. So if you've left it anonymously, but you would like a reply, please could you repost it um, with your details so that we can come back to you. Um, my huge thanks to Zara and Boz for their valuable input and expertise. If you do have any further queries, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, and I hope you, you know, we've got a series of um, webinars going forward each week and I very much hope that you'll be able to join us for those. So all that leaves me to say is I hope you have a wonderful evening and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.